we've now had six meetings at this committee uh, at clause by clause, and we are still stuck on clause one. We're still stuck on the very same amendment we were six meetings ago. It's hardly a tale of parliamentary efficiency or effective use of tax dollars, and I think the Canadian public uh, rightly understand that. Um, I haven't had a chance to uh, put my voice on the record on this whole, so um, I'm going to ask colleagues to indulge me for a bit because I have a few things that I want to get on the record. Uh, first of all, what I would like to say is that in politics, as in life, trust is easily broken, but it's extremely hard to repair. Um, the way this amendment landed uh, has frankly been a complete and total abuse of process. And, you know, the reason why we're hung up here is because we as committee members, with our limited resources, especially on the opposition side, are now being asked to do a tremendous amount of extra work on a bill that should have been done by the government side. To land this amendment on our lap at the 11th hour, after we've completed witness testimony, uh, I had no chance whatsoever to tailor my committee strategy based on an amendment that is going to affect long guns. And I'll tell you what, the irony of all of this, because I know how important Bill C-21 was to this government, the irony is, is that uh, if this amendment hadn't been dropped at the 11th hour, we'd be having a very different conversation right now. Uh, we'd be talking probably about how C-21 was sent off to the Senate and we would be conducting important work on C-20. That's being held up by this mess, again, of the government's own creation. Uh, C-20 is an important piece of legislation that's going to create much needed oversight, transparency and accountability to the RCMP and the CBSA. That's something we've been talking now for seven years. So, you know, I know there's frustration on all sides, but this was brought about uh, by the government. It should have been anticipated because it's like the Newtonian laws of politics. For every action, there's going to be an equal and opposite reaction. And I have to tell you that uh, correspondence-wise, you know, I've talked to colleagues from all parties, but some members of my caucus uh, they had not received one single piece of correspondence on C-21 until this amendment dropped. And now it's making up half their correspondence. The way it was rolled out uh, is going to be a textbook example for future generations on what not to do. On what not to do for how you amend your own bill, communication strategy, the list is long. So I, I need to get on the record just how displeased I am because it, 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 I think it took for granted uh, the important work we've been able to do at this committee. And just to underline, Mr. Chair, uh, just how egregious this was, um, you know, as soon as the amendment came to our attention, I had my, um, my legislative assistant contact the Library of Parliament because we wanted to get a sense of how sub-amendment uh, G... Uh, how that was going to impa impact firearms models. Uh, we also wanted to get a sense of how the scheduled list was going to compare with the May 2020 OIC. And, uh, you know, our analyst, uh, to, their, to their immense credit, uh, produced a, a pretty amazing document, a, a very long Excel spreadsheet. But they warned us that it was going to be incomplete because they right away checked with the Justice Department and they confirmed that there was no such analysis to share with the Library of Parliament. So here you have a government dropping this amendment on our lap and their own department has not done an impact analysis and we're expected to suddenly take this work up with our limited resources of the opposition. That is a simple no-go. And in fact, uh, Mr. Chair, I want to reference this because I do know when C-21 was introduced on May the 30th, I think it was in an exchange with, uh, with reporters, Minister Mendicino did make mention of an amendment they were thinking of bringing to the bill, uh, which begs the question, I mean, why did the bill have to be introduced on May 30th if already at that point they were thinking of an amendment? 
I, in the very first meeting that we had, we had the minister for the first hour and we had departmental officials in the second hour. And I've got it right here, Mr. Speaker. I asked the Assistant Deputy Minister uh, Talal uh, Dakalbab, and I asked him, uh, you know, in the last minute questioning I had about the May 30th announcement, I asked about, like, what is this amendment? Uh, can you inform the committee of which specific section of C21 you're seeking to amend, what it's going to look like, so that we can have some heads-up notice on this? And his response, Mr. Chair, was, quote, the only thing I could say is that you heard the same thing I did from the minister on TV. I can't comment any further on that one. I'm sorry about that. So an assistant deputy minister, square one, very first meeting, is unable to comment on what is eventually going to be a huge amendment to a bill. So after that, um, given that the assistant deputy minister pretty high official in the department is unable to provide details to me as a committee member, and I'm supposed to do my due diligence on a bill, is unable to provide that information, I dropped it because there were other things in the bill, tangential things that I could see, comment on, things that I had had the chance over the summer of this year to actually speak to my constituents about. I made the effort this summer to, vi to visit the Victoria Fish and Game Protective Association. I had some very frank conversations with people about the handgun freeze, what that would mean, and I took their comments back with me to try and make some fixes based on that feedback. These are law-abiding constituents who simply want to be able to practice their sport. At no time, Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Chair, did I talk to people about their hunting rifles or their hunting shotguns because, again, that wasn't in the bill. It was not defended by the Minister of Public Safety during second reading speech. I did not have the opportunity during questions and comments to ask the Minister about that. I did not have the chance during my own second reading speech to talk about these things because they were not in the bill. So a complete abuse of process. And you know, I have to say, uh, I, I sit on three committees, and I've seen this happen in other committees, especially with consequential legislation. And I'm going to uh, cite Bill C-7 from the last parliament. That was, of course, the, am the amendment to our medical assistance and dying regime, which added uh, track two for people whose death was not reasonably foreseeable. In the debates on that, the first version of C7 included a continued prohibition for persons who had a mental illness as a sole underlying condition. And the government even introduced a charter statement with Bill C7 explaining why that prohibition should continue because there was not enough knowledge, uh, there were still some gaps in you know, whether treatments would be effective. But what happened in that process, uh, Mr. Chair, was that the Senate amended Bill C-7. They got rid of that prohibition, introduced a sunset clause, and then the government accepted it. They accepted it, so it became part of Bill C-7. And then they established a committee afterwards, again, the cart before the horse, so that we as a committee could study something that's already part of the law. That's what, exactly what we are being asked to do at this committee. It is a proposed amendment to a very consequential bill, and now we're being asked to do it after it's been proposed, again, having had no chance to speak to Canadians, having had no chance to speak to our constituents or any affected group. So you can see why there's a strong reaction to this bill. It, it, the way it has been rolled out has, has honestly, I, I think I've said enough on that point. Now, I also will say that... Um, you know, we've had some very helpful testimony from officials here, and uh, they certainly have uh, done their utmost, and I want to salute them to, to walk this committee through many of the technical questions. But I guess the frustrating part of it is that they are limited to technical questions about the wording of the bill. If I want substantive questions answered about impacts, uh, you know, how this was developed, are there other options, they, they cannot speak to those uh, parts of the questions. Um, there has certainly been a fair amount of misinformation. Um, you know, I'll acknowledge, as Mr. Noor Mohammed said, that uh, some concerns out there um, about whether this make or model of rifle or shotgun will be on the list have, uh, have been refuted. 
But again, it goes to communication and rollout. The government should have done this from the get-go to make the Canadian public understand exactly what its intention is. The other thing too, Mr. Chair, is that, you know, for some makes and models, right, after the May 2020 OIC uh, was launched, and, and, you know, by the way, like, let's face it, that section of the criminal code that allows for those orders in council has been used by both liberals and conservatives, and we do have extreme policy lurches in, on both sides. But to go, uh, you know, for some people who, who might have owned a firearm that escaped the May 2020 OIC, Afterwards, they probably said, you know, phew, uh, my firearm is safe, the government didn't take it, and a lot of these are non-restricted firearms that are now being moved to prohibited. They're skipping a step. They're not even going into the restricted category. They're just going straight to outright prohibited. The government never explored other options. I mean, this is kind of the, the sledgehammer approach uh, there were another, uh, never any other options explored. This could have been the homework that was so crucial to be done before the amendment was proposed. So could we have explored options such as tighter licensing requirements for semi-automatic firearms? I understand the concern that's out there. Uh, you know, a semi-automatic firearm can discharge ammunition at a much faster rate than a lever action, a bolt action rifle can. So I understand there are concerns, and yes, there are some makes and models that have been used in horrible crimes. You could find a lot of non-restricted firearms that you could say the same thing about. Um, there's a requirement, Mr. Chair, for restricted firearms, handguns. They all have to be registered. Did the government ever explore that as an option over the concerns that people have with some semi-automatic firearms? Again, we never had the chance to explore a middle ground here to find a compromise. And that's what we as a committee are now being forced to do. The other thing I want to put on the record, because I think last week's announcement by the Assembly of First Nations was a game changer. You know, for a government that has, in the seven years that I've been here, has, has talked about how no relationship is more important than that with First Nations, that unanimous resolution from the AFN uh, should serve as a wake-up call. And I want to remind committee members that it was in the previous parliament that we finally passed an act of parliament to bring Canada's federal laws into harmony with the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So if you look at some of the articles uh, of, the, of the declaration, the fact that you know, Indigenous peoples have the right to maintain and strengthen their distinctive spiritual relationship with their traditionally owned or otherwise occupied and used lands, territories, waters, coastal seas, and other resources, and to uphold their responsibilities to future generations in this regard. Again, this goes to their relationship with the land, the resources that are on it, the, the fact that you know, hunting is not just something that they do for fun. These firearms are tools. They provide for their families. Um, and there are many other articles which establish that states, like the Canadian state, have a duty that whenever we are implementing changes that affect that relationship, affect the way that Indigenous peoples can practice their traditions on their lands, uh, it has a duty to consult. We're being, being asked to do the consultation after the fact. So, if we look at the actual law that was passed in the previous parliament, you know, it states that under the act, the government of Canada will work in consultation and cooperation with indigenous peoples to take all measures necessary to ensure the laws of Canada are consistent with the declaration, prepare and implement an action plan to achieve the objectives of the de declaration, and develop annual reports on the progress and submit them to parliament. I would submit to this committee that given the overwhelming ne negative reaction that we have seen from indigenous groups, that has not been done. Like I, I heard Minister Mendicino in the House today when a specific question was asked of him about the AFN resolution last week, he mentioned that he had spoken to them. You don't, that's not consultation with indigenous peoples. I'm sorry, that's not. You don't announce a policy, you don't announce an amendment to a bill and then consult. 
it happens the other way around. And that was obviously not done. And again, uh, it, it, the other thing I want to mention, we, we know that uh, you know, Canada as a state has a duty under the UN Declaration. I don't think that that has been met in this case. And we haven't had a charter statement issued. Um, I know that for the previous Bill C-21, the one that was introduced in the 43rd Parliament, the government introduced a charter statement. Uh, given how expansive this uh, amendment to the bill is, the, the fact that it is widening the net of what's going to be impacted, uh, I would submit, Mr. Chair, that a charter statement is also needed for this additional section. So I don't think a charter statement requirement for this amendment, uh, compliance with the declaration has been met. Um, there's been talk about like the number of witnesses we, we need. Um, I think absolutely two is not enough. Um, I think 20 might be too high. So I keep on, you know, as, as we've approached this meeting, I've been wondering, uh, you know, if this was a standalone piece of legislation, i.e. if Minister Mendicino, if he, if he felt so strongly about this amendment and had taken the time to make his case in a 20-minute second reading speech, where we would have 10 minutes of questions and comments to ask him about that, where he could stand in the House and defend why this is a strong idea and why it should be passed in principle and sent to the committee. If that was the case, then I would expect that we would allocate the same number of meetings to such a substantive expansion of firearms legislation as we have to C-71 and to C-21. So I would, I would land on eight, eight as a minimum. Eight meetings, uh, you know, with, with that many witnesses, I, I believe we would land somewhere in the neighborhood of 60. You'd have to check my math. But, I mean, we would want to hear from many of the witnesses that we have already had on C-21 because, again, we never had the chance to ask them about the impact on long guns. Uh, we would want to hear from as many Indigenous groups as possible. I mean, at a bare minimum, we're talking about the Assembly of First Nations, the Métis National Council, ITK, representing the Inuit up north. Uh, I know that uh, may, there's been mention of, of, a, of a premier. Uh, we want to know from, from many of the provincial indigenous groups as well. We never had the chance to talk to the various police forces that were here about, you know, what, are, what is your opinion about this? Um, in your experience in law enforcement, is this a a massive problem. Uh, is the way this amendment worded going to help you do your job, et cetera, et cetera? The answers to that might be yes, but we, again, never had the chance to get that on record. Um, I would want to have people from my own writing. You know, I, I, was, I was talking with a constituent today on the phone. Uh, you know, he, he's owned firearms for most of his life. And, you know, he's, he's just bewildered by the fact that, like, you know, I. Like, like, why is my firearm suddenly appearing on, on this list, this scheduled list? Like, like, all I want to do is have my firearm to be able to go out and hunt. And he's an ex-military. He knows how to handle a firearm. It goes to the fact that we've never had the chance as representatives in our own ridings, but across this country, to talk to people. So I understand the intent behind the amendment. Sure, I understand. But it's an abusive process to go about it this way. If you have an idea as substantive of this and you are sure that it's the right way to go, then do it the right way. Submit it to parliamentary process where it goes through a second reading, where it goes through full range of committee meetings, where we have the chance to adequately study it and have the runway to do so, where we can consult with legislative council after having heard from witnesses on whether there might be some appropriate sub-amendments. So I would like, Mr. Chair, to move a, a very small sub-amendment. I do agree with the Conservatives that travel would be necessary. Um, I think that this committee could benefit from having a lot of that hands-on knowledge. But my, so I would keep everything related to travel. And my only change, Mr. Chair, would be that we change the number 20 to 8. And that would be the bare minimum because it's, it's giving this substantive amendment the same respect that we have to the previous Bill C-71 and to the, the current Bill C-21. 
so I will close there. I, I think I've put everything on the record that I needed to. But, um, you know, honestly, we, we are stuck in the mud right now on our seventh meeting precisely because of how this was rolled out. And, and I'm sorry to my Liberal colleagues, but the blame for that lies squarely on your shoulders. They created this mess and they have to find a way to fix it. it it's not our responsibility as the opposition. We're trying our best with our limited resources, but we do not have the vast and powerful resources of a government, of a national government, with two departments, public safety and justice. We don't have the ability to create broad national surveys going out to talk to people. I have myself and my legislative assistant, two people. My caucus is less than 10% of the seats and we're trying our best to find a way forward. But you have to understand that this reaction you're seeing, not only from members of the opposition, but from the public, is precisely because of how this landed. And, and, and the, my Liberal colleagues have to wear that and take responsibility for that. So I'll close with that, Mr. Speaker. So I want to make sure that my sub-amendment was, in fact, moved. Thank you. I acknowledge your sub-amendment uh, to uh, change 20 to 8. So that